Good morning and welcome. Um, some of you want to come forward, but uh, there's some seats here, but we're going to go ahead and start on time. So, interesting topic to start our morning, talking about averting war. Um, but let me give you some the broader context. Um, first, my name is Lee Howell. I'm head of global programming, a uh, member of the managing board responsible for the annual meeting of new champions. So welcome again to Dalian and welcome to this 11th annual meeting of new champions, the Summer Davos. But I'm also responsible for an initiative uh, we're going to launch in the autumn, really a platform to look at key geostrategic issues. Because if you reflect for a moment, the theme of this meeting here in Dalian is achieving inclusive growth in the fourth industrial revolution. Well, if you reflect on that, it's based on two pre fundamental premises. One is that uh, there is peace and stability in the world, and in particular, the two countries that we most associate with the fourth industrial revolution, which is China and the United States, uh, are working together uh, towards that goal. And so we thought it was very important, really, to introduce um, at the beginning of this annual meeting, an important session to really reflect on the broader geostrategic context. The second uh, point I want to share with you is in my past role of the forum, I was our head of our, our editor in chief of our global risk report. And today, when I travel around the region, uh, I speak to a number of our constituents and members and partners, and we inevitably get to a conversation about global risks, and they talk about US and China as really their key concern. I do so, I, in, in those conversations, I do remind them that this is not really a risk because a risk is, uh, most of you are familiar with the notion, it's somewhat measurable. We can assign a probability to it. We typically know the, the mode of occurrence and certainly uh, consider and at least try to measure or mitigate against its impact. But this U.S.-China question is a true geostrategic uncertainty. Uh, and this, therefore, it's really a great privilege and honor that we can have with us this morning Professor Graham Allison, uh, Douglas Dillon, Professor of Government at the Harvard University, Director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, uh, former Dean of the Kennedy School of Government, and I would argue in my lifetime he has advised formally or informally every Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and every Head of Intelligence. So it's very timely that we have Professor Graham Allison with us today, but even more timely and I think more appropriate because he's just written a wonderful new book, a must read, and I, it's something I read on the flight here and I feel privileged to have a copy today. Um, it's, as you're probably aware, Destined for War, Can an American China Escape the Cities Trap? Now, we've taken a little bit of a liberty and focused this session on averting that war. <laughs> But we're, it's a real pleasure and honor to have with us Professor Allison. And what we'll do today is he will present and he'll give us a really his, share his insights and what he's collected uh, through in this new book. But also we'll have um, an opportunity to hear from Professor Wang Dong, uh, Associate Professor at Peking University, uh, a, a really a top scholar on Sino-US relations, and he understands it very well from both a historical and contemporary perspective. We'll invite him to respond to Professor Allison, uh, Graham Allison's uh, uh, remarks. And then if time permits, we hope to have an opportunity to engage you uh, with the questions uh, with uh, the two of them. And then following that session, we'll have the privilege to go to the uh, plenary session, the opening plenary session uh, with the premier. So I would love to welcome uh, Professor Allison uh, to the stage, to the beta zone, and uh, very much uh, look forward to his uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Lee, and thank you for coming out this morning. So uh, I think consistent with the uh, efforts of the World Economic Forum, uh, taking account of security as part of the total picture, as Lee said, is something that I know Klaus Schwab feels very strongly about. And interestingly, just in the last several months, Xi Jinping has opined on the same subject, arguing that security is a prerequisite for development. So what I'm gonna to do today is introduce you to a big thinker, or reintroduce some of you, but maybe for the first time, some of our Chinese audience. I'm gonna introduce a big idea, uh, and then I'm gonna give you a 
a short account of some of the best ideas in this book uh, in the hope that I'll uh, be able to interest you in uh, reading further. So the big thinker is Thucydides. I know that some of our Chinese colleagues are not familiar with Thucydides. He should be part of your mental library. And so let's just say out loud, Thucydides. Do it again. Thucydides. Good, good. Uh, so Thucydides was the founder of history. He's the first person to write down a history book that tried to give an account of what actually happened. And he gave an account of the competition between the two great city-states in classical Greece 2,500 years ago. So Thucydides is somebody you should know about. The big idea is Thucydides' trap. Thucydides' trap is a term I coined about five years ago, and which is part of the subtitle of this book. Thucydides' trap is the dangerous dynamic that occurs when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power. Think rising China and predominant US today. And as Henry Kissinger, America's greatest living statesman says, Thucydides' trap is the best lens available for piercing through the noise and the news of the day to understand the driving dynamic in the relations between the US and China today. So this topic has already come into lively conversation in the policy community and among uh, in, and in government. So let's see what uh, some of the- We should strictly base our judgment on facts, lest we become victims to hearsay, paranoid, or self-imposed bias. There is no such thing as the so-called Thucydides trap in the world. But should major countries time and again make the mistakes of strategic miscalculation, they might create such traps for themselves. So President Obama and President Xi talked about this at uh, the last of their summits. So let me summarize. What is inevitable in the relationship between a rising power and a ruling power is a dangerous dynamic. That's inevitable. What is not inevitable is the outcome of that competition. War is not inevitable. Indeed, the principal purpose that I had in writing this book is to help us focus on the danger that's created by a rising power threatening to displace a ruling power in order for us to find ways to avert war. So I'm gonna use the remainder of uh, my time to focus a presentation around three questions. I'll give you, a tr in, in uh, respect for our, our American president today, I'll give you a tweet size answer for each of these. And then I'll say a few words more about them. First question is, what has been the geopolitical event of the past generation, the past 25 years of your life and my life? The second question is, what is the cardinal geostrategic challenge in the world today and for as far as any eye can see? And the third question is, can America and China escape Thucydides trap? So my tweet size answers. First, the big geopolitical event of the past generation has been the rise of China. Never before has a nation risen so far, so fast, on so many different dimensions. The geostrategic challenge, the second question, for today and for as far as the eye can see, is the impact of the rise of China on the ruling US and the international order that the US created in the aftermath of World War II that has largely accounted 
for seven decades without great power war, which is itself a historically anomalous event. So the impact of the rise of China on the US and the international order. And the third question, uh, can US and China escape through Thucydides' trap? Excuse me for being professorial, but the answer is no and yes, okay? So no. If the US and China insist on business as usual, we should expect history as usual. And history as usual in this case would be a war that would be catastrophic for both parties. So that's the no. Yes, on the other hand, because only those who fail to study history are condemned to repeat it. So if, God forbid, we should find ourselves in a war between China and the US next year or the year that followed, Xi Jinping and Trump will not be able to say some iron law of history made us do this. It will be for mistakes that were made and the failure to take actions that could have been taken. So that's my three questions, that's my three tweets. Let me say a word more about each. So most of you here are Chinese and don't need to be told about the rise of China. But the book has a great chapter, I think, for Americans and for other internationals who are not familiar with the rise of China. On the left is a bridge that goes between the Harvard Business School and the Harvard Kennedy School. This bridge was started construction in 2012. It was to take two years. It's now in its fifth year and it's not, no, no finish in sight, okay? The other bridge, I'm sorry that if we didn't get it here, go back to it, if this goes back. Let me see here. The other bridge here is the Sanyan Bridge, some of you are familiar with here in, the, in Beijing. In 2015, it was reconstructed as well. How long did it take to complete? Somebody take a guess. Hmm? 40, 43 hours. 43 hours. Go to YouTube, you can see it. This is the YouTube clip, okay? So I would be very happy for the people who did that to come to Harvard and complete our bridge, okay? <laughs> okay. So in the course, uh, I uh, give students uh, a quiz. Here's the quiz. Uh, when will China become number one? I first ask them, uh, I give them 26 indicators. They guess 2030, 2040, 2050, not in my lifetime. I then give them the second chart, which has come up here, with the answer is already, okay? So already, in the past generation, China has become number one in each one of these dimensions. The most billionaires, the fastest supercomputers. Indeed, the largest economy in the world today is China, measured by the single best yardstick which is purchasing power parity, which is judged by both the IMF and the CIA as the best yardstick for comparing national economies. So the rise of China is the biggest, the big, big event of the past generation. Point two, the geostrategic challenge going forward, the impact of the rise of China. So Thucydides taught us and this is one of the most famous uh, single quotes in international relations studies. It was the rise of Athens and the fear that this instilled in Sparta that made the war inevitable. So basically, Thucydides' trap reminds us that when nations rise and threaten the major ruling power, great danger. Alarm bells should sound. These are just some, some re reminders of how things turned out badly. A Greek war, the uh, uh, Russo-Japanese war, the uh, Korean war, and the Cuban Missile Crisis. In the book, I look at the last 500 years. I find 16 cases when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power. In 12 of the cases, the outcome is war. In four of the cases, the outcome is not war. So Thucydides' line about uh, war, 
war being inevitable was exaggeration, hyperbole. But the proposition that when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power, there's extreme danger, war is even on the historical record more likely than not, is correct. In the book, I try to uh, get us to look at these cases, to think about them, because if the objective is averting war, we can learn a lot from the mistakes that were made, particularly in the case of World War I, and also from the success stories. So, to the third question, the impact of the rise of China and the prospects for escaping Thucydides' trap. Are China's current leaders serious about displacing the U.S. as the predominant power in Asia in the foreseeable future? If you ask this question to China scholars, you will hear them shuffle around and say it's complicated on the one hand, on the other hand. They will make a best effort to avoid answering it. Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of Singapore, uh, who built Singapore, and who was called by every Chinese leader from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping, mentor, because they sought him out, uh, often spoke his mind very vividly. I asked him this question. What is his answer? Of course, why not? Who could imagine otherwise? How could they not aspire to be number one in Asia and in time the world? So this is no, if U.S. and China behave business as usual, a rising China that threatens to displace the U.S. in the Asian context in the foreseeable future could end catastrophically. The committee meets today to consider the nomination of General James Mattis to be the Secretary of Defense of the United States. I thank uh, both Senator Nunn and Senator Cohen for being here. He's probably the only one uh, here at this table who can hear the words Thucydides trap and not have to go to Wikipedia. Of course, Secretary Cohen has insulted every member of this committee by suggesting that we don't readily understand that. Uh, we're going to have to manage that uh, competition between us and China. Uh, there's another uh, piece of wisdom from antiquity that says fear, honor, and interest always seem to be the root causes of why a nation chooses to go to hostilities. So that's just a clip from the confirmation hearings of Secretary of Defense Mattis uh, with a little debate about Thucydides' trap. Another one of Thucydides' good lines is the proposition that wars occur between states. Uh, the, the nations are driven by three factors, interests, fear, and honor. That's another reason you may want to look at this book, and you will also will want to look at Thucydides. So what has been the impact of the rise of China on the U.S. and the international order? Uh, I imagine the U.S. and China as sitting on opposite ends of a seesaw in a, in a school play yard. In 2004, uh, you can see China is about 15% the size of the U.S. in terms of GDP. In 2014, the big takeaway from the IMF World Bank meeting is China is number one. Became slightly larger than the U.S. By 2024, the U.S., uh, China will be about half, half, on the current trend lines, China will be half again larger than the U.S. So what impact does this have on the international order? Basically, this is the, these are the tectonics. This is the substructure, this economic basis. And therefore, as you look at the relations between China and each one of its neighbors in Asia, and China and the US, you can see this reverberating. Let's see here. So, sorry. Uh, you probably noticed that uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Trump met in Mary Lago in April for an initial summit, focusing in particular on the risks that occur in Korea. The most dangerous hotspot on the globe today is Korea. Uh, I would say if you're not able to think, to, to, to think about how you can get from current events to a war in which thousands of Americans and Chinese are killing each other, Think about North Korea. Indeed, if the question is, could North Korea drag China 
and the U.S. into a war neither wants? The answer is 100% yes, because it already has. That's what happened in 1950. So go back and read about the first Korean War. In the current situation, in the months immediately ahead, either Kim Jong-un is going to launch or test ICBMs that will be able to deliver nuclear warheads against the American homeland. That's on the one hand. Or, on the other hand, somebody's going to interrupt that. And that somebody may be President Xi Jinping, or it may be Donald Trump. And if Donald Trump were to do this, I would say uh, he suggested at Mary Lago that his way of doing this would likely be an airstrike on North Korea. And you play out that game, and you could easily see a second Korean War. To end, then, finally, on a, on a positive note, at the Mary Lago summit, President Trump demonstrated one thing for sure, that is that he understands the art of the show. Okay? So, as you know, in the Chinese tradition, uh, the emperor uh, looked for guests to, uh, from foreign countries, especially to show respect. President Trump received uh, President Xi Jinping and his wife, and at the initial uh, meeting, he's standing here with his granddaughter, Arabella. She's five years old. And what did she do? So here's a five year old who in Mandarin sang Jasmine, which is Lee Kuan Yew's wife's signature song, and then actually cited a bit of, of uh, poetry as well. Xi Jinping was completely blown away. So conclusion, if US and China could bring to the challenge that they now face between a rising power and a ruling power, the kind of imagination reflected in that part of the Mar Lago summit, the answer is certainly yes. So I look forward to the rest of the discussion, particularly uh, Professor Wang. Thank you, Professor Allison. Just give us a, such a comprehensive overview of your uh, new uh, book. And uh, I have to say that I actually was discussing with uh, Philip and other colleagues last night whether in my remarks, response, reaction to your presentation, I should be very harsh and critical or just trying to be nice. Uh, but then I thought maybe being a little bit of critical and harsh will actually promote the sales. Uh, especially given the fact that uh, Professor Allison's book uh, will be translated into China and will be, uh, uh, will be put on sale here. So a Beida professor harshly criticizing Professor Allison's book maybe help a little bit of the sales. Um, I myself uh, teach at a school, International Studies at Peking University, and currently I also serve as the Secretary General of uh, uh, Pang the Pango Institution, a leading public policy think tank uh, in China. Um, so, I think nowadays, as Professor Allison just uh, rightly also outlined uh, in his presentation, the Thucydides trap has already become a very hard catchphrase uh, in the policy circles, I think, in China and also elsewhere. Uh, and we know that President Xi Jinping, uh, President, uh, Professor Allison's slide shows that back in the, uh, 2015, he actually quotes that, but actually back in uh, 2013, I think uh, when uh, Professor Allison, your article first appears, it quickly, I think, actually got into uh, the policy uh, circles, narratives here in China. And uh, uh, Prof uh, President Xi Jinping, actually, in one of his meetings with a group of Western uh, visitors, actually said, we should all work together, try to avoid uh, Xi Jinping's trap. And I know that last month, uh, Professor Allison, actually, uh, he briefed the National Security Council in the White House. And by doing that, I'm sure that the President Donald Trump now, uh, at least he also learned uh, this concept. Um, so, so it is, um, to a great extent, I think 
how the U.S.-China relations will evolve to, agree, to a great extent will determine uh, the future trajectory uh, of uh, the regional peace and order and even to a great extent the global order. So um, I just want to again to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 you know, offer my warm congratulations uh, to uh, Professor Allison for writing such an admirable, uh, admirable work. Uh, it is uh, truly uh, an uh, inspiring uh, and a fascinating reading, and I'm sure it will bound to be a classics uh, in the literature. Uh, so, uh, so with that, I think uh, I would offer would like to also take the opportunities to uh, offer uh, three very quick uh, comments and uh, and and also questions as well. The first one is regarding the question of inevitability. So, Shishiti seems to suggest this is the case. Uh, in, in his book, uh, The uh, uh, Peloponnesian War. Uh, but I, I would like to also to quote another very prominent historian, uh, Professor uh, Donald Kagan of U uh, U uh, University, who also ha has written a master piece on, the, on this war. Uh, he actually, Professor Kagan actually seems to disagree. He disagrees with uh, Xu uh, this uh, belief that uh, the war between the Eastern and the Sparta is inevitable. And that, of course, then begs the question, uh, what role human agency actually play uh, in uh, determining the course of war? So will uh, a war between a rising power and an established power uh, be determined by structural factors, such as power, interest, ideology, or by non-structural uh, factors? And uh, uh, the history of uh, uh, Peloponnesian War actually shows that, as Professor Allison just quotes, um, the hubris, uh, fear, and honor uh, may also just drag states uh, into hegemonic war. Uh, and actually, I would also add to the list uh, factors such as uh, prejudice, uh, misperception, paranoia, etc. Those are, we call it emotions. So to what extent, uh, a hegemonic war between rising power and, and established power, really it's determined by, are determined by structural factors or like human agency, emotions, and other non-structural factors. So this will be my uh, first comments and question to uh, Professor Allison. And my second uh, comment is that, uh, in fact, I actually believe uh, the more challenging, more uh, imminent challenge we are facing nowadays actually is not Shushiti's trap. It's actually the security dilemma. So I think that before we arrive at the point where a rising power and a ruling power uh, will engage in a uh, uh, sort of hegemonic uh, struggle power or war, uh, we probably will be experiencing an extended period of time of worsening sort of continually worsening security dilemma. And in fact, if we look at uh, the current uh, US-China relations, I think in many ways, uh, it actually uh, suggests that is the case uh, in the South China Sea, uh, in uh, North Korea. Both China and the United States believe their policies, strategies, actions are defensive. And while, whereas at the same time, they regard the other parties' actions policies as aggress aggressive and offensive. So this is a very classical definition of the security dilemma. So we are in dilemma. All the powers, all the players, they are only pursuing for the purpose of security, but uh, unfortunately it will be interpreted by the other party as being expensive. So, so this really, I think, gets to uh, the question. So whether or not uh, you know, we should really, uh, of course, uh, it is extremely important, as Professor Allison's book just suggests, for uh, sort of educate uh, uh, the policy community and the public uh, of the importance of the suicide trap and how we should learn from history and uh, to avoid uh, this suicide trap. Uh, history will not simply repeat itself, but it definitely says a lot about the future. So, uh, but my question here is that, uh, in your view, uh, if we wanted to actually, I think last March, I also, uh, 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 we have hosted Dr. Henry Kissinger 
as well um, at, at the Pangong Institution. And we have this honor of having this conversation with Dr. Kissinger. And one of the questions I ask for him is that uh, he actually asked us, the younger scholars at the table, and uh, myself being one of them, is what is the largest, most imminent challenges facing your child relations? Then my answer is, was at the time the secure dilemma. And he actually very much agreed with that. So my question to you, second question to you, uh, Professor Allison would be, uh, if you, if you, how important do you think, if you, you know, security dilemma, is security dilemma more important uh, for uh, nowadays when, when we are going to think about your child relations or uh, social trap? If it's the former, then uh, what are the best ways, uh, the measures, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we should take, try to uh, lessen, if not uh, completely reverse uh, the worsening security dilemma between China and the United States? And my very last uh, question, of course, uh, is uh, many people actually, uh, uh, they argue that uh, the development of nuclear weapons uh, or and uh, the uh, globalization uh, process or the complex interdependence between China and the United States from both negative uh, uh, perspective and the positive perspective seem to provide a very strong constraint uh, to the prevention of a uh, really hegemonic war or uh, a, a power struggle between the two great powers. So my question to you is that, uh, to what extent do you think those uh, factors actually they matter, or you think we, uh, there are reasons for us to be more pessimistic about uh, the prospects of a hegemonic war between uh, China and the United States? Uh, and with that, uh, so, Professor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Very should good. I stand here or come in out? Okay. Whatever. Thank you. So, I think our time is brief, so I, I won't do justice to three good questions. These are ones for us to discuss uh, at a seminar, but let me give quick answers, and I'll do them in reverse order. I think on the, uh, the last question, uh, are circumstances today with nuclear weapons, economic entanglement, uh, globalization so different than the past that we shouldn't be worried about a rising power versus a ruling power. I would say no, not so different. People always are tempted to imagine that history is uh, uh, irrelevant because of the past. I would say that similarities are bigger than the differences. On the other hand, in trying to construct a successful uh, uh, a path for avoiding uh, a Thucydides trap, Taking account of this bedrock of common interests, I think, is essential. And in those, I think the three points you mentioned are very important, as well as climate, which I would also put in the same perspective, where the two parties will either have to work together to deal with the problem, or they'll fail uh, to get apart. So uh, to the second question on the security dilemma, this is a little bit of an academic argument for, for some of you, but there's no question that there is a security dilemma. This is de defined as I'm taking actions that are defensive, but you perceive them to be offensive, and vice versa. The, 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 the security dilemma is greatly enhanced in the context of a Thucydidean dynamic, and the Thucydidean dynamic, I think, is much more fundamental because when a rising power is actually rising, and is intending to displace the ruling power, as Lee Kuan Yew suggested about China versus the US today, that becomes the focal uh, 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 vision or the focal uh, fact for the two parties. In that circumstance, the trust between the two parties is reduced to zero because I know you're trying to displace me. And you know I'm trying to prevent you from displacing me. Similarly, the behavior of each is misinterpreted maximally because it's not simply that you would be in a normal security dilemma taking an action that could be misinterpreted, but that I know you have an ulterior motive for everything, even when it's benign and vice versa. And, and I think most importantly, this Thucydides and dynamic leaves both parties vulnerable to the impact of external actions or third parties' actions that would otherwise be inconsequential or easily managed 
but which nonetheless set off the actions and reactions by the two primary actors. So that goes to the first question on inevitability. As I say in the book, I believe read in context, Thucydides meant this as hyperbole, that is exaggeration for the purpose of emphasis. He just meant very likely, not 100%. So the structure that sets, the, that sets the, the, the setting, but then there's human agency, which is what the human agent makes of the structure. I, I say in the book, uh, you know, basically destiny deals the cards, but how the players play the hands is up to them. Okay. So in this case, I think as we think about inevitability, certainly not war inevitable, choices to be made by the parties, very important choices, and what we need to do is illuminate those choices through, I think, both looking at the cases of success and looking at the cases of failure. So each one of these deserves further uh, discussion, but I think Philip is telling me we may have come to the end, yes? Okay, good.